Chapter Ten, Part One of the Scouts of Stonewall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Scouts of Stonewall by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter Ten, Winchester, Part One. Ashby's troopers put the armed guard of the wagons to flight in an instant, and then they seized the rich pillage in these wagons. They were not yet used to the stern discipline of regular armies, and Ashby strove in vain to bring most of them back to the pursuit of the flying enemy. Harry also sought to help, but they laughed at him, and he had not yet come to the point where he could cut down a disobedient soldier. Nor had the soldiers reached the point where they would suffer such treatment from an officer. Had Harry tried such a thing, it is more than likely he would have been cut down in his turn. But the delay and similar delays elsewhere helped the retreating northern army. Banks, feeling that the pursuit was not now so fierce, sent back a strong force with artillery under a capable officer, Gordon, to help the rear. The scattered and flying detachments also gathered around Gordon and threw themselves across the turnpike. Harry felt the resistance harden, and he saw the pursuit of the southern army slow up. The day, too, was waning. Shadows were already appearing in the east, and if Jackson would destroy Banks' army utterly, he must strike quick and hard. Harry, at that moment, caught sight of the general on the turnpike, on Little Sorrel, the reins lying loose on the horse's neck, his master sitting erect and gazing at the darkening battlefield which was spread out before him. Harry galloped up and saluted. I could not come back at once, sir, he said, because the enemy was crowded in between Ashby and yourself. But you've come at last. I was afraid you had fallen. Harry's face flushed gratefully. He knew now that Stonewall Jackson would have missed him. If the night were only a little further away, continued Jackson, we could get them all. But the twilight is fighting for them. And they fight for themselves also. Look how those men retreat. They do well for troops who were surprised and routed not so long ago. He spoke in a general way to his staff, but his tone expressed decided admiration. Harry felt again that the core of the northern resistance was growing harder and harder. The hostile cannon blazed down the road, and the men, as they slowly retired, sent sheets of rifle bullets at their pursuers. Detachments of their flying cavalry were stopped, reformed on the flanks, and had the temerity to charge the victors more than once. Harry did not notice now that the twilight was gone, and the sun had sunk behind the western mountains. The road between pursuer and pursued was lighted up only by the constant flashes of cannon and rifles, and at times he fancied that he could see the vengeful and threatening faces of those whom he followed. But it was only fancy, fancy bred by battle and its excitement. The pursued crossed a broad, marshy creek, the Opequan, and suddenly formed in line of battle behind it with the cavalry on their flanks. The infantry poured in heavier volleys than before, and their horsemen, charging suddenly upon a Virginia regiment that was trying to cross, sent it back in rapid retreat. After the great volleys it was dark for a moment or two, and then Harry saw that General Jackson and his staff were sitting alone on their horses on the turnpike. The northern rifles flashed again on the edge of the creek, and from a long stone fence behind which they had also taken refuge for a last stand. Harry and his comrades urged Jackson off the turnpike, where he was a fair target for the rifles whenever there was light, and into the bushes beside it. They were just in time, as the night was illuminated an instant later by cannon flashes, and then a shower of bullets swept the road where Jackson and his staff had been. Harry thought that they would stop now, but he did not yet know fully his Stonewall Jackson. He ordered up another Virginia regiment, which, reckless of death, charged straight in front, crossed the creek, and drove the men in blue out of their position. Yet the northern troops, men from Massachusetts, refused to be routed. They fell back in good order, carrying their guns with them, and stopping at intervals to fire with cannon and rifles at their pursuers. Jackson and his staff spurred through the Opequan. Water and mud flew in Harry's face, but he did not notice them. 
he was eager to be up with the first because jackson was still urging on the pursuit even far into the night banks with his main force had escaped him for the time but he did not mean that the northern commander should make his retreat at leisure harry had never passed through such a night it contained nothing but continuous hours of pursuit and battle the famous foot cavalry had marched nearly twenty miles that day they had fought a hard combat that afternoon and they were still fighting but jackson allowed not a moment's delay he was continually sending messengers to regiments and companies to hurry up and always to hurry up faster and faster and yet faster harry carried many such messages in the darkness and in the confusion his clothing was half torn in by briars and bushes his horse fell twice stumbling into gullies but fortunately neither he nor his rider was injured often he was compelled to rein up suddenly lest he ride over the southern lads themselves all around him he heard the panting of men pushed to the last ounce of their strength and often there was swearing too once in the darkness he heard the voice of a boy cry out oh lord have mercy on me and let me go to hades the devil will have mercy on me but stonewall jackson never will harry did not laugh nor did he hear anyone else laugh he had expressed the opinion that many of them held at that moment stonewall jackson was driving them on in the darkness and the light that he furnished them was a flaming sword it was worse to shirk and face him than it was to go on and face the cannon and rifles of the enemy they called upon their reserves of strength for yet another ounce and it came the pursuit thundered on through the woods and bushes and across the hills and valleys but the men in blue in spite of everything retained their ranks on the turnpike retreated in order and facing at intervals sent volley after volley against the foe it was impossible for the southern army to ride them down or destroy them with cannon and rifle harry came back about midnight from one of his messages to jackson who was again riding on the turnpike most of his staff were gone on like errands but general taylor who led the acadians was now with him off in front the rifles were flashing and again and again bullets whistled near them harry said nothing but fell in behind jackson and close to him to await some new commission they heard the thunder of a horse's hoofs behind them and a man galloped up he as well as his horse breathing hard he was the chief quartermaster of the army and jackson recognized him at once despite the dark where are the wagon trains exclaimed jackson shouting forth his words they're far behind they were held up by a bad road in the lurry valley we did our best sir replied the officer his voice trembling with weariness and nervousness and the ammunition wagons where are they the voice was stern even accusing but the officer met jackson's gaze firmly they're all right sir he replied i sacrificed the other wagons for them though they're at hand you have done well sir said jackson and harry thought he saw him smile no food for his veterans but plenty of powder it was exactly what would appeal to stonewall jackson supply more powder and bullets to the men said jackson presently keep on pushing the enemy never stop for a moment harry mechanically put his hand in his pocket why he did not know but he felt a piece of bread and meat that he had put there in the morning he fingered the foreign substance a moment and it occurred to him that it was good to eat it occurred to him next that he had not eaten anything since morning and this body of his which for the time being seemed to be dissevered from mind might be hungry he took out the food and looked at it it was certainly good to the eyes and the body was not so completely dissevered after all as it began to signal the mind that it was in very truth hungry he was about to raise the food to his lips and then he remembered spurring forward a little he held out the bread and meat to jackson it's cold and hard sir he said but you'll find it good it's thoughtful of you said jackson i'll take half and see that you eat the rest give none of it to this hungry horde around me they're able to forage for themselves jackson ate his half and harry his that reminded most of the officers that they had food also and producing it they divided it and fell to with an appetite as they ate a shell from one of the retreating northern batteries burst almost over their heads and fragments of hot metal struck upon the hard road they ate on complacently 
When Jackson had finished his portion, he took out one of his mysterious lemons and began to suck the end of it. Midnight was now far behind, and the pursuit never halted. One of the officers remarked jokingly that he had accepted an invitation to take breakfast on the Yankee stores in Winchester the next morning. Jackson made no comment. Harry, a few minutes later, uttered a little cry. What is it? asked Jackson. We're coming upon our old battlefield of Kernstown. I know those hills even in the dark. So we are. You have good eyes, boy. It's been a long march, but here we're almost back in Winchester. The enemy are massing in front, sir, said Dalton. It looks as if they meant to make another stand. The Massachusetts troops, their hearts bitter at the need to retreat, were forming again on a ridge behind Kernstown, and the Pennsylvanians and others were joining them. Their batteries opened heavily on their pursuers, and the night was lighted again with the flame of many cannon and rifles. But their efforts were in vain against the resistless advance of Jackson. The peal of the southern trumpets was heard above cannon and rifles, always calling upon the men to advance, and summoning their strength anew, they hurled themselves upon the northern position. Fighting hard, but unable to turn the charge, the men in blue were driven on again, leaving more prisoners and more spoil in the hands of their pursuers. The battle at three o'clock in the morning lasted but a short time. The sound of the retreating column, the footsteps, the hoofbeats, and the roll of the cannon died away down the turnpike. But the sound of the army marching in pursuit died also. Jackson's men could call up no further ounce of strength. The last ounce had gone long ago. Many of them, though still marching and at times firing, were in a mere daze. The roads swam past them in a dark blur, and more than one babbled of things at home. It would soon be day, and there was Winchester, where the kin of so many of them lived, that Winchester they had left once, but to which they were now coming back as conquerors, conquerors whose like had not been seen since the young Napoleon led his republican troops to the conquest of Italy. No, those Frenchmen were not as good as they. They could not march so long and over such roads. They could not march all day and all night, too, fighting and driving armies of brave men before them as they fought. Yes, the Yankees were brave men. They were liars who said they wouldn't fight. If you didn't believe it, all you had to do was follow Stonewall Jackson and see. Such thoughts ran in many a young head in that army, and Harry's, too, was not free from them, though it was no new thing to him to admit that the Yankees could and would fight just as well as the men of his South. The difference in the last few days lay in the fact that the Southern army was led by a man, while the Northern army was led by mere men. The command to halt suddenly ran along the lines of Jackson's troops and before it ceased to be repeated, thousands were lying prostrate in the woods or on the grass. They flung themselves down just as they were, reckless of horses or wagons or anything else. Why should they care? They were Jackson's men. They had come a hundred miles, whipping armies as they came, and they were going to whip more, but now they meant to rest and sleep a little while, and they would resume the whipping after sunrise. It was but a little while until dawn, and they lay still. Harry, who had kept his eyes open, felt sorry for them as they lay motionless in the chill of the dawn, like so many dead men. Jackson himself took neither sleep nor rest. Without even a cloak to keep off the cold of dawn, he walked up and down, looking at the silent ranks stretched upon the ground, or going forward a little to gaze in the direction of Winchester. Nothing escaped his eye and he heard everything. Dalton, too, had refused to lie down, and he stood with Harry. The two gazed at the sober figure, walking slowly to and fro. "'He begins to frighten me,' whispered Dalton. "'He now seems to me at times, Harry, not to be human, or rather, more than human. It has been more than a day and a night now since he had taken a second of rest, and he appears to need none. He is human like the rest of us.' but the flame in him burns stronger. He gets cold and hungry and tired, just as we do, but his will carries him on all the same. I'm thankful that I fight with him and not against him, said Dalton earnestly. 
Yes. And you're going to march again with him in five minutes. See the gray blur in the east, George? It's the dawn, and Jackson never waits on the morning. Jackson was already giving the order for the men to awake and march forth to battle. It seemed to most of them that they had closed their eyes but a minute before. They rose, half awake, without food, cold and stiff from the frightful exertions of the day and night before, and advanced mechanically in line. The sun again was yellow and bright in a clear blue sky, and soon the day would be warm. As they heard the sound of the trumpets, they shook sleep wholly from their eyes, and as they moved, much of the soreness went from their bones. Not far before them was Winchester. Banks was in Winchester with his army. The fierce pursuit of the night before had filled him with dismay, but with the morning he recalled his courage and resolved to make a victorious stand with the valiant troops that he led. Many of his officers told him how these men had fought Jackson all through the night, and he found abundant cause for courage. Harry and Dalton sprang into the saddle again, and as they rode with Jackson, they saw that the whole southern army was at hand. Ewell was there, and the cavalry, and the Acadians, their band saluting the morning with a brave battle march. It sent the blood dancing through Harry's veins. He forgot his immense exertions, dangers, and hardships, and that he had had no sleep in twenty-four hours. Before him lay the enemy. It was no longer Jackson who retreated before overwhelming numbers. He had the larger force now, at least where the battle was fought, and although the northern troops in the valley exceeded him three or four to one, he was, with his single army, destroying their detached forces in detail. End of chapter 10, part 1